Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the UBC Learning Circle, hosted by the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Um, very, we're very pleased today to welcome back to the circle Miranda Kelly and Danette Jubenville. Um, together, we're all going to chat through uh, supporting Indigenous birth during a pandemic. Um, what that sort of um, what that process looks from start to finish. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle. So quick little trigger warning here. Uh, the topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. If that's you for today, please make sure that you're looking after yourself. If at any point you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, family member, whatever that support network looks like for you, please don't hesitate to access it. Uh, so on to introductions. In case you didn't know, my name is Cole. I'm from the Chowetel First Nation. I'll be facilitating the discussion today. Other Learning Circle team members in the room are Cynthia, our production room, are Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Winona, our assistant coordinator. Uh, if you feel so inclined, please introduce yourselves in the chat box um, so we can kind of generate that discussion. Uh, with that, I think um, I did it. I did it in really good time today, uh, and I'm gonna <laughs> pass the mic on over to Miranda and Danette. Please take us away. Great, thanks, Cole. Hi, everyone. My name is Miranda Kelly, and my ancestral name is Tilian, and I'm Stalo from Sawali First Nation, and I also have ties to Cowichan, Sumas, and Stenemo First Nations and ancestry um, on my mother's side from Russia, um, Scotland, and Wales. Um, and I'm joining in today from the unceded ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, where I'm really privileged to um, benefit from the bounty of these lands and to work on these lands, serve families, and raise my own children here on these lands. Um, I am a member of the Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective. I've been working as a doula for a couple years, um, but have been working in Indigenous health um, my whole career. Um, and I'm really honored to be um, joining all of you today to talk about this really important topic of supporting Indigenous birth during a pandemic. And it's always really an honor and exciting for me to present alongside my sister, Danette. Um, she's been one of my mentors and my teachers and my allies in this work. So I'll pass it on to her so that she can introduce herself. Well, thanks, Miranda. I'm going to start crying already. <laughs> Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Danette Jubinville. My Anishinaabe name is V. Washakwe. On my father's side, I belong to the Seer family from the Pasqua First Nation in Treaty 4. We're Cree and Anishinaabe. And um, on my mom's side, I'm German, Jewish, Scottish, English descent. Um, and I was born and raised out here in Coast Salish lands, and I currently live and I'm zooming in from East Vancouver and the shared territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I am a mother to uh, an almost five-year-old on Monday <laughs> uh, daughter named Keiston. I am a founding member of the Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective, uh, which we started back in 2015 while I was pregnant. And I am a PhD student in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. And my PhD research focuses on um, exploring what an Indigenous doula service delivery model can look like in British Columbia. And I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much to the UBC Learning Circle for setting all of this up and for um, inviting us back and um, honored to present along uh, my sister Miranda as well. Oh, I also wanna say that um, as a part of our presentation, um, I'm, I'm honored um, to be able to share some reflections on my sister's experience of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum during this pandemic. Her name is Alana Jubinville, and um, she may or may not be um, joining in on the call today. So I just wanna acknowledge her and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to um, who she is and her story towards the end of our presentation. Awesome. So um, today in this session, we're going to be discussing how this pandemic has been impacting Indigenous birth um, and trying to walk through how it's impact impacted at each stage. So with prenatal care and then giving birth and what the hospital policies have looked like, um, what doula support has looked like. 
and then also what the postpartum period has looked like and how that's been impacted. So we'll be offering some of our reflections as doulas who've been working through this pandemic and hopefully brainstorming with some of you um, the ways that we can adapt and support people as they're going through pregnancy and childbirth in the postpartum periods during this time, which has been an unprecedented time. Um, but we wanted to start off by getting to know who's in the room with us a little bit. So Cynthia, if we could bring up the poll. Um, we're wondering if everyone could please participate in this poll and let us know um, what role you have in joining us today. And you can choose all that apply to you if you're a parent, a nurse, maybe you're expecting, um, healthcare provider, community service provider, community member, doula. What is a doula? <laughs> so we can get to that, but really quickly, a doula is basically a companion that can offer support, um, emo emotional support, physical support, informational support, um, social support, spiritual support um, throughout the pregnancy, in childbirth, and in the postpartum period. Just reading through all your introductions. Um, beautiful, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Nice to meet you. Ah, lots of doulas. Hey, doulas. <laughs> and community members, service providers. Lots of parents, too. Great. Well, thank you. So I'm glad that collectively we bring lots of perspectives. Um, and different experiences. And we're really interested in hearing from you and learning from your perspectives as well. So please do use the chat function to share your thoughts and your questions. And we want to try to address them as we go, um, but we'll also make sure to stop at a few points and um, ask for your input. So we can skip ahead to the next slide. Yeah, we can go one more. Thank you. Um, so, we're all dealing with COVID-19 right now. We're all aware of how this has impacted our day-to-day -day lives. And it is a novel virus um, in that we haven't seen this particular virus before. Um, but our Indigenous communities, we have experienced um, epidemics before. And so since contact, epidemics including smallpox and whooping cough and measles and influenza have spread throughout Turtle Island and really actually devastated Indigenous populations. And some communities increased, um, sorry, some communities experienced mortality rates of like 50 to 90% of their population, which you can imagine that's a huge impact on communities to lose that many members. And when you lose that many people from your community, what you're also losing is your traditional knowledge, your traditional education systems, your traditional health systems, traditional food harvests. Um, so these experiences of loss were really devastating to our people. And we're seeing these sorts of impacts today with this pandemic in terms of how our economy and our education, our distribution of goods, and our healthcare system are all being impacted by this pandemic. So, you know, we can relate to, and we can imagine what our ancestors went through, um, you know, in, in previous epidemics, how their whole world was impacted and, and their whole life was impacted. And then since that time, um, we've experienced colonial policies and practices under the Indian Act and things like residential schools and the 60s scoop that have continued to impact our communities and further those losses and create those disconnections from our traditional practices and traditional knowledges. Um, so we have been going through this really dark period for a long time. And I think for a lot of people, we're really feeling how um, dark and scary it can be when we're in a pandemic and, and um, you know, that it's been going on for a number of months now and it, it starts to feel like there's no end. It can feel really dark. Um, but moving on to the next slide. I also wanted to acknowledge that even though it feels like a heavy time right now, um, that our Indigenous communities have got through this before and we can get through this again. Our communities have been able to repopulate and that's through this gift of birth. Birth is this site of revitalizing and um, and bringing this great gift of babies and children to our community. 
And so in the same way that our ancestors held hope for us and our generation, we can hold hope for these new generations that are joining us and that are yet to come. Um, so since the time of those past epidemics that impacted our communities, um, we've also seen that birthing practices have changed and been impacted through the medicalization of birth in the past century. And so many of our traditional birth practices um, have been sleeping in our communities um, and that we've lost touch with some of those practices. But you know, births are continuing to happen. And so every day there's a continued opportunity to reconnect with those birthing practices and reclaim those traditions and assert our sovereignty in birth. And we as Indigenous people can carry that blood memory from our ancestors to guide us through pregnancy and through birth. So Danette and I really want to take a moment to extend our gratitude and acknowledge all of the expectant parents out there and the new parents out there who are bringing babies earthside. Um, you're offering a beautiful gift of hope and a sacred gift of children to our communities. And you deserve to be well cared for right now in this season of need. This is a season when you really deserve to be cared for. And so we keep hearing through this pandemic that we're all in this together. And I think it's really important that we as community members, as service providers, recognize that we own the responsibility of taking care of new parents right now and showing up for them as their village of support. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to share this quote that birth is a ceremony binding indigenous life to the land. And that's a quote by Erica Finestone and Cynthia Sturbys. And I just really love that quote. And for me, I end up um, visualizing it kind of as this cycle where we have indigenous people and land and birth all connected in this cycle. And this is really a guiding principle for us in our work as indigenous doulas. Um, this is kind of our, our guiding principle in terms of reclaiming and decolonizing birth. Um, and what we aim to do in our work as Indigenous birth workers is to strengthen these connections, the connections between Indigenous people, our land, and our birthing practices. And I think it's really beautiful that this teaching is actually in our birth um, process itself, in the physiology of birth. So I have these pictures here. Um, the top is of some trees and the bottom is that's a picture of a placenta. Um, that's actually my placenta um, from my birth of my second daughter. Um, and on that placenta, that's the fetal side of the placenta. And you can see what we call the tree of life. So that teaching is right there on the placenta reminding us that birth connects us as people to the land um, through that tree of life. And I, I just love that that reminder is right there in the birth process, in the physiology itself. Um, so what we can recognize through, um, through processes of colonization um, and also the medicalization of birth is that this cycle of connecting people and birth and land has been um, threatened and there's been disconnections introduced through practices such as outlawing traditional midwifery and requiring that births be attended by nurses and doctors, um, the evacuation policy, which requires indigenous peoples to be leaving their community at 36 or 37 weeks gestation to go birth in, um, in a larger um, urban center, um, the forced and coerced steril sterilization of indigenous women, which is continuing to happen, um, and also newborn apprehension, which again is continuing to happen. Um, these are all colonial policies and practices that have resulted in um, disconnect between our people, our land, and our birthing practices. And then particularly during this pandemic, we're seeing restrictions that are being introduced for um, safety purposes during the pandemic. But again, these are practices that could potentially be disrupting this 
connection between our people and our land and our birth practices. So for example, um, partners and children not being able to attend prenatal visits um, or not additional family members not being allowed into the hospital to support um, the labor and the birth. Um, not being able to visit in the hospital in the postpartum unit to meet the baby. Um, there are travel restrictions, so people not, may not be able to come and be with their family to meet the new baby, to support the new parents. Um, there's restrictions on social gatherings, so people aren't able to have you know, baby showers and gather in the same way and, and receive the same kind of community support that we would have prior to the pandemic. Um, so really we see, you know, birth is still continuing to be impacted during this pandemic and perhaps even more so. Um, and so it introduces some new challenges to us as birth workers and people who are supporting um, families to continue to find new ways to really try to um, mend these connections and strengthen these connections um, to reclaim traditional birth practices and, um, and you know, assert our, our sovereignty over birth. Next slide. So we wanted to take a moment to ask of you, what aspects of pregnancy, birth, and early parenting have been impacted in your communities? Cole, do you mind reading out any comments or questions that are coming in? Sure thing. Uh, oh, here they come. <laughs> OK. Uh, so we have. Um, Christina was the first one to respond and just simply said all of them. Um, we had Emma mentioned in particular, Manitoba has a significant number of children in care. Um, Deidre, lack of support. Uh, Amanda, people are very isolated in early parenthood, which I could imagine would very much so be the case considering um, all the uh, social bubble restrictions that we're seeing um, put in place. Kate mentions postpartum support. Arlene again with all of them. Uh, Sara, increased stress and uncertainty about the birth process. Um, Corinne, like you mentioned, only pregnant person allowed in appointments, very isolating. Uh, Krista, all of them here in Williams Lake. Nicole, lack of support. Amanda, loss of connections. And other rooms, partners, postpartum restrictions less access to support. So I'm seeing a lot of trends um, that seem to be focusing or centering around isolation or feel, feelings of isolation, as well as a lack or a loss of support and the ability to access that support. Um, yeah, having friends and newborns hearing about the disconnect, uh, no partners or families allowed at visits, absence of family community at births, uh, new parents are isolated, Masks during labor, <laughs> that, would be, uh, that would be challenging. Increased restrictions for babies in the NICU. Mm -hmm. um, more of a sense of isolation and postpartum. Lack of family in the room has been paramount huge impact on birth process and immediate postpartum. Mastering labor and scrubs is a change. Separation due to children and care. Yeah, birthing folks not being able to have a support person in the room. Not being able, or sorry, not being able to introduce my five month old to a significant uh, amount of her family has been hard on everyone. not being able to return to their home community due to fear of bringing in COVID to small communities, not being able to have my mother, lack of family support, anxiety and depression, evacuation policy, visitation limitations. Yeah. And, um, and the, it's uh, 65 more responses after that. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and say, if I'm not reading out your message, it's not because it isn't important. Um, we really appreciate every single response. Um, you sharing this really intimate part of your life with us. 
um, together. It's really stimulating our conversation. So thank each and every one of you. Um, Ruth, anxiety about everything. Uh, Michelle, lack of human touch. Having to live alone in a hotel with a newborn, newborn postpartum. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. Again, the same, the same themes keep coming up again and again and again, that isolation, um, the lack of, of ability to access supports and the lack thereof of supports um, and feeling cut off from your family and your community. Thank you all so very much for your responses. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's a lot. It's heavy. It's a lot to deal with. I'd love to be able to get a copy of this transcript so I can read through it all. We definitely will. We okay. can. Thank you. Because <laughs> I think there's a lot of like richness there to capture. And I think, okay. you know, there's, there's a lot of stories to be told that aren't being told right now. Um, we're all still in the middle of the pandemic, so it's hard to be able to take a step back and reflect, but I, I really want to be able to capture what's being shared because all of this is so important and really needs to inform how we move forward. And I mean, for myself personally, as someone who's worked in Indigenous health for a long time um, and has heard over and over again that change takes time, um, you know, we were able to respond remarkably fast when the pandemic hit and hospitals were able to change policies overnight, um, which makes me think, you know, we really need to be getting these messages out there because when it comes to Indigenous health um, and health of Indigenous people, especially in birthing, like, we know the system can change quickly, so let's make our demands. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a great point there. Absolutely, Miranda. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great point, and and it, and it does that you're not just for well. I mean, we're we're focused on pregnancy and birth here today, but for all sorts of different things, you know, in terms of postpartum care um and early education those sorts of things we know that these policies can be can be changed so let's in this time of change let's let's make sure that we have this data or this information to support us here yeah yeah so thank you everyone for sharing all of your thoughts um and i'm gonna get that transcript of the chat and process how we can use that moving forward um so if we can move on to the next slide um, so did it and I wanted to share also some of the aspects that we've seen that have been impacted and how um, our clients are being impacted and our, our work is being impacted. Um, so within prenatal care, um, you know, we're seeing that folks who are pregnant are potentially having fewer in-person appointments with their doctor or their midwife. Um, perhaps they're having phone appointments. This has been pretty common with the clients that I've been working with. Um, and for some people, you know, they actually don't mind. They don't even have to leave home <laughs> to go sit in a waiting room and go to the clinic. Um, but for a lot of people, they're feeling like I'm not really getting the chance to know my health care provider as well because I'm not seeing them. I'm just talking to them. And especially for the partners who are the support people that are planning to be there at the hospital um, when the person's in labor, they're also not getting the chance to speak to or meet this health care provider. So I've worked with couples where the husband has actually never met the healthcare provider until the day that they're in labor and meeting their baby. Um, and so that aspect of it can be pretty hard. It's also hard when you have to go to your appointments without your other children or without your partner, um, especially when we're to being told to limit our contact with other people. It can be hard to find childcare for your older children so that you can go to your appointments and you know, your partner is feeling less involved in the process and not being able to ask their questions that they have. Um, and then, you know, there's also fewer op been fewer options in terms of additional care that you might be seeking. So for example, through massage or chiropractics or acupuncture. Um, earlier in the pandemic, these sorts of services were closed down. And since they've reopened, a lot of uh, clinics have had um, fewer appointment times um, and just making more barriers to access. And again, for people who have older children or who are low income, it's hard, it can be harder to access these sorts of additional supports. Um, and again, also with prenatal education, um, some classes have been offered virtually. Um, but that does have access barriers to people who may not have a computer, or may not have access to internet. Um, and then a lot of people, 
mentioned this aspect of social isolation. And that's really hard. A lot of expectant parents have had really high rates of anxiety um, during this pandemic. And rightfully so, we started off really not knowing anything about COVID-19 and not really knowing like, how could this impact my pregnancy? How could this impact my birth, my baby? Um, what is my care gonna look like now? So a lot of anxious parents and a lot of stressed out providers because the providers also didn't really know what to expect and, and how this was gonna go. Um, you know, it's hard when you're getting less face-to-face -face time with your provider to build that relationship and feel like you're able to ask all of the questions that you have and get all of the information that you need. Um, so yeah, it's been a hard time. Um, I, do say, I do think that, you know, as we're learning more about the virus um, and, you know, there's research emerging kind of on, on, you know, knowing a little bit more about how it could potentially impact people who are pregnant and, and babies, um, you know, that, that has helped, I think, ease a little bit of the anxiety, um, but there is still a lot of anxiety. And especially now that we're in the second wave and we're seeing increasing cases and we're also seeing outbreaks in hospitals, there is still a lot of fear there. Um, so next slide. So for those of us who are doulas, and it sounds like there's a lot of us here, um, for community members and parents and other people who don't work necessarily in the hospital or within the hospital system, um, you know, that there's sometimes it feels like it's limited in terms of what we can do to influence hospital policies and practices. We can certainly be advocates, um, but what we can start doing immediately is really providing community care. Um, and so we really like to see family acknowledged as the front line. Um, we've been hearing a lot during the pandemic about the healthcare providers on being on the front line. Um, and while that's you know, true to the extent that they're on the front line within healthcare services, like um, really the family is kind of the first point of contact that can provide care to people. Um, and so we want to really acknowledge that family and community members are out there doing really important work in the community. And so as, you know, frontline support workers in community, what we can do is work with pregnant people so that they know what their rights are and that they know their options. Um, so this involves, you know, some education around, you know, what does it look like when you go and have an interaction with your healthcare provider? Do you know, um, you know, how to advocate for yourself to know what your rights are? Do you know what to ask what all your options are and the benefits and risks of those options? And are you able to stay informed? I found with a lot of the, um, fam the families that I've been working with during this pandemic that um, some people are feeling particularly overwhelmed with the amount of knowledge out there. Um, it can be hard to keep up day to day with what's happening because, you know, at times it feels like it's changing day to day. The information that we get about COVID, um, the way that hospitals are changing their policies, it, it feels like it could be almost daily. And so it can be really overwhelming to the pregnant person to feel like, I don't even know what's happening right now. And I just don't have the bandwidth to be like doing all of this reading and research. So as support people to the pregnant person, we can help them stay informed. We can help sift through all of that information and know where to find reliable information and well-sourced information and help them feel like they don't have to try to sift through it all, that we can help with that process and make sure that they're staying informed and, and passing on the information that we feel like is really important for them to know. Um, if people are taking virtual prenatal classes or when they're having virtual appointments with their healthcare provider. Um, family members and partners can participate in that. That is a good way to try to stay connected and involved in the process so that the pregnant person doesn't feel lonely in the process, um, that they it can um, help with that sense of isolation, that they're not going through this pregnancy alone. They have family and a community around them that's participating with them as much as they can. And because pregnancy can be hard and demanding physically, um, it's not too early to start in pregnancy for household members and family members to start rallying and taking on more responsibility with household duties. So, you know, doing a grocery order and having it delivered to them or dropping off some me meals at their doorstep, or um, if there's a safe way of helping with childcare um, to offer those things to help alleviate some of that stress and, and um, and demands that the pregnant person may be feeling. 
And really as you know, family and friends and community members, we can be looking for ways to offer companionship. And that can be hard in a time when we're being told to stay home and to socially distance and, and stay um, you know, away from gatherings. Um, but what we can do is try to innovate how we connect. So even just a text to check in can actually mean a lot to someone who's feeling kind of lonely. Um, and so you can figure out what can virtual support look like? Can we have, you know, a weekly FaceTime chat or text every other day to check in? Um, that really can be a good way of just checking in on someone and seeing how they're doing and maybe establish a bit of a um, routine so that after the baby comes, you've already established this routine of staying connected and being able to check in with them. Next slide. So this is an infographic that was recently released by the Native Women's Association of Canada. It's not specific to maternity care, but it is, um, I think, a helpful infographic for someone to um, think about knowing what their rights are when they're accessing health care. And so it's a reminder of things like that you have the right to medical treatment, that you have the right to information so that you can make an informed choice. You have the right to withdraw your consent or refuse. Um, you have the right to get a second opinion and you have the right to complain. Um, so this is important information to know. And I think as doulas or other people working in community service roles or in um, healthcare settings that we can be reminding the families that we work with that this is your right. Um, and if you go to the Native Women's Association of Canada, they also have a larger toolkit related to this knowing your rights. So that's just um, an additional tool that I wanted to, you to be aware of. Um, and I did want to highlight the fact that systemic racism doesn't go away just because we're in a pandemic. Um, if anything, it's, you know, adding additional stress to the healthcare system and potentially, you know, adding more ne negative interactions between healthcare providers and clients because everybody is stressed and everybody is feeling anxious and fearful right now. Um, so emotions are heightened. Um, and, you know, it, just this week, actually, on Monday, um, a report was released on um, anti-Indigenous racism in the healthcare system here in BC. And so, you know, we know and it's proven that racism exists in the healthcare system. And so as an Indigenous person going into birth, like that is another barrier. You're on top of being, um, you know, it, it's a pandemic and you're giving birth during a pandemic, you're also giving birth within a racist healthcare system. Um, so it's really helpful to be able to know your rights ahead of time, um, know that you can say no and um, start practicing some of that language around, well, is this mandatory? Is this medically necessary? Is this a medical emergency or do I have time to consult with someone else to make my decision? Or where's the evidence for this recommendation? Um, next slide. So I also just wanted to share a couple more resources. The World Health Organization has some information um, regarding childbirth during COVID. And I really think it's important um, to just remind everybody that you do still have the right to a safe and positive childbirth experience, whether or not you have a confirmed COVID-19 infection. Everybody still reserves respect, deserves respect and dignity and has the right to a companion. Um, and clear communication and pain relief strategies and all of that. And that it is um, safe to go ahead and continue breastfeeding if that's your plan um, and that people should be supported to um, move forward with their plan to breastfeed if that's their choice. Um, and another um, resource that I will also mention is evidence-based birth. And the website for that is evidencebasedbirth.com. Um, and since early in the pandemic, they've been releasing regular updates on all of the emerging research related to childbirth and COVID-19. So that's a great resource to go ahead if you want to look at some of what the research evidence is showing related to um, childbirth and safety protocols during this pandemic. Next slide. Um, so with all of this said, I think it is really important to remember and acknowledge that empowered births can happen anywhere, anytime, even during a pandemic. And certainly I have had clients that have had really wonderful birth experiences during this pandemic. Um, and so I think part of that comes with knowing what your options are, um, 
feeling really empowered to make your, your own choices for yourself, um, really feeling like you have a good relationship with your healthcare provider that can go a long way. Um, what I will say is that I've heard from some of the midwives that I've been working with over this pandemic that they have had an increased interest and demand for home birth. And I think it is really important to have home birth as an option. I see that popped up from one of the um, comments in the chat, more home births. <laughs> yes, um, you know, in my experience as a doula, just in my observations, I would say that probably my clients who've had home births have been the least impacted by the pandemic in terms of restrictions and changes to their labor and birth experience. Um, the main difference I'd say is that the birth team is wearing masks at your home. Um, I think probably from the midwife's perspectives, there, there's been a bit more of an impact because for them, um, there are you know new protocols and policies to follow to ensure like safety and cleaning of all the equipment, um, and you know in terms of their capacity, they are experiencing a greater demand for their services and and for offering home birth. Um, and earlier in the pandemic, some of my clients who were working with midwives were warned that, you know, if our clinic, um, if any of our midwives are required to quarantine and we have limited capacity, we may not be able to support your home birth. And that's because for home birth, you need to have two midwives present. Um, so if their team capacity is lowered because of somebody, you know, having an exposure or needing to be quarantined, um, you know, there is the reality there that midwives have limited capacity. Um, and so for me, you know, it does raise the question is of will the healthcare system respond with increased investments in midwifery care and looking at how we can, um, you know, increase the access to home birth and potentially other options like birth centers. I think just taking into account how the pandemic has um, impacted birth could perhaps, um, you know, inform and shape policy moving forward. Next slide. Um, so while home birth is a great option, um, not everybody will choose to home birth or have access to that. And so a lot of my clients and a lot of the people that are out there birthing right now are doing so in the hospital. Um, and it's been hard to keep up with the hospital policies. Um, I found that, you know, because our information about COVID-19 changes day to day that the hospitals are trying to keep track and keep up with their policies and procedures. And so since March, um, hospital policies and procedures have been changing regularly. Uh, so I think it's really important as the expectant parent and as supports to that person that we keep informed and try to know ahead of time what your hospital policies are to look into like what is the policy in the labor and delivery unit, how many support people are allowed in, um, what's the policy for the postpartum ward and for the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, trying to keep informed as much as you can about what the changes are. Um, you know, try to look up your hospital website if they have information there, or maybe call your website, or sorry, call your hospital to find out um, what's happening. Ask your healthcare provider, like what has it been like for you attending births there recently? Is there anything I should be aware of? Um, things you might wanna consider are parking, do you know where to go to park? Because maybe that's changed during the pandemic. I know for me, I attend a lot of births at BC Women's and some of the parking has changed around there during the pandemic. Um, and also which entrance to use, that may have changed as well. Um, what's the in and out policy? If you arrive as a support person to someone in labor, are you allowed to come and go or do you have to stay once you're inside? Um, what are the food options available when you're there? Um, you know, are you allowed to have a doula with you? These are the sorts of things that you'd like to find out ahead of time if possible, and that can help relieve some of your anxiety if you know what to expect. Um, and also, just because the policy is written a certain way doesn't mean it's being implemented that way. Um, so sometimes you kind of just have to show up and, and ask, and honestly, sometimes it depends on which staff are working that day. Um, so it doesn't hurt to just ask for what you want and see if you can get it. Um, you know, ask if your doula is allowed in with you, 
bring her along and see if anyone stops her along the way. <laughs> or, um, you know, ask, ask if you can have um, someone deliver some food to you. Like, that, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, or wait until the next shift change and ask the new nurse that comes on. <laughs> um, ask again and see if you can get what you want. Um, but I think it's really important that as the person who's going to be laboring and also the person who will be there as a support person um, to be prepared to advocate and be prepared to ask for what you want. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of the, um, the pictures here that I have. So the first picture on the left, um, this sign was actually only up for a few days because I came back a few days later after I took this picture and the sign was gone. But that's just an example of how some of the um, parking had changed at this hospital. The middle, um, it shows a sign at the Tim Hortons in the hospital saying that they're no longer accepting cash. This was in March. I think it's changed since then. Um, but the reality is that can put up barriers for people who don't have credit cards or debit cards. Um, if they only have cash and cash is not being accepted, then they can't get their Tim Hortons. Um, that can really put up some barriers for some people. And it was a barrier for some of my clients. Um, and then the last photo is me in, you know, scrubs and scrub cap and, and a mask. Um, and that was a bit of a struggle, you know, early in, in the pandemic um, to even find masks and to find the PPE that we needed as doulas. And, and I know midwives were struggling too to find what they needed. Um, we were being told like, don't go out and buy the medical masks, the, he the healthcare providers need them. So people were scrambling to make their own cloth masks at home. Um, thankfully, that's changed, and I think for the most part, people are able to access masks that they need, and I think hospitals are trying to make them available to people who are coming into the hospital. All right, next slide. So I wanted to offer this reminder um, to people who are expecting and as support people um, that you always have the option of bringing your ancestral medicine with you. Um, I try to remember this as well for my own well-being and my spiritual wellness when I'm walking into a birth, um, to stop and take a breath, set an intention and say a prayer. Um, you can always bring your ancestral medicine to you in the hospital, in the labor room, in the OR, in the postpartum unit, wherever you go, you can bring your ancestors with you. Um, you can also bring your plant helpers with you. So um, if you have um, some medicine that you want to bring, you may not be able to burn your medicine, but you can bring it in with you and have it close to you. Um, a medicine bundle or a bundle like this, I have sage. Um, but, you know, you're welcome to still do that, to bring your medicine in that form with you. Um, bring your tea, bring your water bottle. Um, I have to say that just the basics of air and water and food can be really helpful. So in terms of air, like take some deep, deep breaths, have someone fan you, you know, water, you can <clears throat> bring your water bottle with you, stay hydrated. Um, ice can help, showers can help, baths can help. Um, even an IV, sometimes I've seen clients who are just feeling kind of gross and when they get the IV fluids, they actually feel quite a bit better. Um, and foods, feel free to bring your comfort foods with you. Make sure your partner has food for themselves as well. Um, and Danette reminded me to point out the importance of that first meal after birth. Um, usually in the hospital, they'll offer you some toast, um, but <laughs> feel free to bring your own comfort foods or traditional foods, um, something that will you know, offer you some nourishment and some love after you've done the great work of bringing your baby Earthside. Um, you can bring items of significance, cultural significance, or spiritual significance, or um, just comfort items from home, like your own slippers, your own house coat, your own pillow, um, your own playlist. I love when people bring music with them, and I actually find it helps lighten the mood and even makes the nurses a bit happier, so feel free to do that as well. Um, and, you know, bring your phone charger, have your phone handy. You can call your family members. Um, you know, you can FaceTime with them, have them still be present with you in that way, um, if that's what you want. Prior to the pandemic, almost all of my clients had 
additional family members with them. They may have a partner and then also their parents or siblings or their partner's parents or siblings or other members of their family. Um, it's quite common to have multiple members of the family. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's cultural and that's social. And those are really important things for a lot of people. And it has been hard not being able to have those additional family members in the room with you when you're laboring and welcoming your baby. Um, so you can get creative about it. You can have them on the phone and keep the phone near you while you're laboring so that they can still talk to you and offer you encouragement um, and feel like they're a part of the process. Um, but I wanted to offer the reminder that the physiology of birth itself can be ceremony. So for me, when I think about, um, you know, aspects of birth like the moaning and the sweating and the positions and the movement that we our body does and gets into um, all of that can be part of our ceremony as well I think about some of the ceremony that we do like in the sweat lodge or in the longhouse and um, it may be kind of similar um, experiences for our body in terms of the sweating or um, the crying or the blood or the moaning. Um, so I really want to just honor the fact that birth is still ceremony, um, even if it's not, uh, you know, exactly the birth plan that you had in mind, um, but that that intention can come from within and the way that you experience your birth can still be very individual and ceremonial to you um, and to your experience and that your sisters, your ancestors are there with you no matter what and no matter how your birth unfolds, um, it's a spiritual time regardless of how your baby's born. Next slide. So hopefully in your prenatal care, you get the chance to get to know your provider and talk about what your preference is and maybe you create a birth plan and share that with your doctor or your midwife. Um, but sometimes when you're going into the hospital to birth, um, it may not actually be the doctor or midwife that you've been seeing who's there with you um, while you're giving birth, or you may have a nurse there that you've never met before. Um, and so, you know, hopefully you're able to establish some good communication, but sometimes, especially when you're in labor and you're in pain and you're feeling lots of emotions, it can be hard to find the words to communicate what you want to say. And so these are just some examples that I like to offer to my clients of ways of kind of speaking up for yourself and advocating for yourself. And I think you can think of your own voice as a member of your birth team, as part of your ancestral medicine, that you have this strength inside of you to speak for yourself and to find that strength inside to say, you know, I don't agree with this. No, I need you to stop. I'd prefer something else. I don't wanna do that. I feel pressured. I feel coerced. I need more information. I want a second opinion. This is my choice. My answer is no. Um, I think sometimes people have a hard time practicing these skills. So as family members and as doulas and community members, we can help offer these reminders. And if you're that one support person that's going into the labor room, I think it's really helpful if you practice this language for yourself um, and that you can be an advocate for the person who's asked you to be there as a support. Next slide. So um, some hospitals are continuing to allow doulas in. Um, it hasn't been consistent and it's been stressful as a doula and stressful for our clients to not always know, is my doula gonna be allowed into the hospital? Um, I wish that we had a consistent policy across the province and across health authorities, but we don't. Um, it's largely been dependent on the health authority and the hospital to set what their policy is. Um, so a doula, um, most of you know what this is, and I did mention it earlier, but a doula is a non-medical support person, someone who can act as a companion during the pregnancy and the childbirth and the postpartum experience, and we can offer emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual support. Um, a lot of doulas have had to modify what their practices look like during this pandemic, so um, many Many doulas are, for example, offering virtual consultations and virtual prenatal visits to limit the number of um, in-person meetings that we're having um, in following the, the recommendations around uh, avoiding in-person social gatherings. 
Um, and that's a bit challenging to try to get to know someone um, in this intimate way that we serve as doulas um, and really only meeting them potentially for the first time in person when you're showing up to their home or in the hospital while they're laboring. Um, but that has been the reality for many doulas is that that ha is how we've been practicing. Um, for myself, I've been able to continue to offer in-person support in the hospital during this time, but some doulas are also offering virtual support for the labor and the childbirth. So much like we talked about, you can have, as the pregnant person, you can have your family members or friends on the phone with you while you're in labor. You could have your doula on FaceTime or Skype or on the phone with you, offering you support virtually during your childbirth experience. And later on, we'll get into what virtual postpartum care could look like. So next slide. So moving on to once the baby's arrived, um, we can see in the first um, few days postpartum while somebody's still in the hospital and yet to be discharged, um, how they've been impacted by the no visitors policy. Um, a lot of people are used to their family members or friends being able to come visit them while they're still in the hospital and to meet the new baby. Um, but that has not been allowed in, in I think most hospitals um, at this time. And as a doula, I, I haven't been permitted into the postpartum unit as well, although that's been a little inconsistent. I, I have tested it a few times and been allowed in, but it depends on the staff. And I've had times when I've been kicked out once the staff changes and the new nurse comes on. Um, but again, that just gets to back to, you know, asking for what you want and kind of testing like what is the implementation of this policy? Maybe I will be allowed in. You can always give it a try. Um, so yeah, I, I have noticed that some of my um, my clients have actually said, um, you know, I I actually don't mind that there's these restrictions right now. It's giving me a chance in the in the early days to really just rest and to get to know my baby, to bond with my baby, and establish breastfeeding and have fewer visitors overall. It's actually been helpful for my recovery. Um, and, and I think, you know, that there is some benefit there and in thinking about how we approach the postpartum period in general, even after the pandemic, um, to just think of those early days as a really sacred time for the birthing person and the baby to have some time together and to rest, focus on rest and recovery and bonding. Um, but that said, you know, we're also seeing emerging research that there are increasing rates of postpartum depression and anxiety during this pandemic. And that speaks to, you know, the many of you that commented on the levels of isolation right now and how um, anxiety levels are up and there's a lot of fear and a lot of loneliness. And that's a reality too. And that really speaks to the need for this community care that we offer as doulas and family members and community support workers that our roles are really critical and actually are essential care. Um, so I think we can all um, take lessons from babies. This, ba this <laughs> Babies are teachers. I, I do believe that babies are sacred gifts and that they are teachers to us. And of all the people that I know and have interacted with during this pandemic, babies by far have been the least bothered by our orders to stay home and self-isolate. Um, they don't seem to mind at all just staying at home and only really interacting with their few um, household members, the people that they know and love and are closest to. Um, they seem totally content to do that. And I think we can all follow their lead and really just acknowledge that this is a really unique time, um, that it is time limited. This isn't going to last forever. Um, and so, you know, it's okay to stay home. We don't have to worry about missing out on anything right now. There's really not much going on in the world out there. We can stay home and just enjoy this baby magic. 
Um, but it is hard, you know, in terms of the postpartum care that people require after they've given birth um, to be able to get out to appointments when your partners aren't allowed. Um, you can't bring your older children, just like for the prenatal appointments, there are barriers to being able to get to your appointments. And I've actually heard from clients as well that they're having missed follow ups that they're not hearing back from their clinics, they're not hearing back from their OBs or their doctors to schedule their six week follow up. Um, and those appointments just aren't happening. And I I think that's um, really unfortunate that, that, that those gaps exist and that people are falling through the cracks because it is really critical to have those check-ins um, and to be able to check in with someone and say like, how are you feeling? Um, are you experiencing postpartum depression or anxiety or any signs of that? Um, how is your body feeling? Are you still bleeding? How's your healing going? How's your incision if you had a surgical birth? Um, all of those things, it, there's a reason why we need these follow-up appointments and we can't let it fall through the cracks just because it's a pandemic. All right, next slide, and we'll pass it on to Jeanette. Thanks, Miranda. Um, everything's been so well said so far, and the knowledge is so rich, so thank you. Um, so I just want to take a, a few moments to build on this idea of family as frontline in the postpartum period. Um, so thinking about ways that we can enhance postpartum care um, for ourselves as um, birthing people and families and also as helpers and community members. Um, so first thing I wanted to say is that um, I think it's important to focus on um, a little bit of prep. I think a little bit of prep goes a long way and that often there's a lot of emphasis on um, a birth plan and getting ready for labor and delivery and a lot less emphasis on planning and preparing for the postpartum period. And then um, I think we find that when people arrive um, in, this, um, in this stage of postpartum that sometimes they feel underprepared and it can be really challenging and stressful. Um, so I think that a postpartum plan um, is really crucial and I try to uh, work with my clients to, um, to think about things like, um, for example, just asking um, pregnant folks to take some time to reflect on um, how they want their postpartum care to look and feel, um, what supports do they think they want to have in place, um, things like uh, relatives, community members, doulas, lactation consultants, who are the support people that they want to show up for them in the postpartum period and how. And also just thinking through um, boundaries around care, um, particularly right now during COVID. Um, are you comfortable with in-home visits? Um, or would you prefer virtual care, things like that? Um, and then I, I think it is also important um, for people to remember that postpartum care is an essential service, um, however that looks. And um, it, it can be confusing um, to, think about how to bring people into our care team during this time. Um, I think that um, as helpers, if, if we are um, invited into people's homes, that we can honor families by following um, COVID hygiene guidelines, wearing masks, um, lots of hand washing, um, just paying special attention to, to cleaning, um, that kind of thing. And, um, and that I've also seen that it's especially challenging for my clients right now. Um, I, I think this is true pre-pandemic, but particularly right now, um, to gather the essential supplies that they might need in the postpartum. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, things like groceries, um, nipple cream, bottles, baby vitamin D, things that we know that we're going to need for sure. Um, those things can be really just difficult to obtain right now and potentially just really stressful to think about, you know, if you have to leave um, while you're healing um, or with your baby in early postpartum with, with the pandemic out there, um, that's not ideal. Um, so I, I would suggest that pregnant folks try to identify at least two support people who can make um, supplies runs for them and then also just try to gather those things as much as possible in the prenatal period. Um, when I go to uh, visit a client, I never show up empty handed. So I always bring food, um, herbal tea, um, herbs for a sits bath and I just go to London Drugs and pick up a plastic sits bath as well that they can use. Um, I always text my clients before heading over, is there anything I can pick up for you? Um, that kind of thing. 
um, and in these pictures here, um, there's some sitz bath herbs cooking in a pot and then some bone broth that I prepared um, to stock my sister, uh, my sister's freezer while she was pregnant. Um, so also just thinking about um, stocking up your freezer in advance with um, warming, nutrient rich, easy to digest, healing foods for the postpartum period can go so far. I think it's a total game changer. Um, for for families, and that's something that people can ask for as a um, as a baby shower type gift, um, or ask their friends and families to do for them in the prenatal period. Um, people, I think people like to um, be told how they can help and um, and be given a sense of purpose, especially when they really want to help their uh, their relatives um, during this time. So that's definitely something that they can do. Um, and then I think um, as well, just with the food piece, remembering that um, our ancestral foods and um, medicines can be really wonderful to bring in for that nourishment and nutrition um, and also just comfort and family and cultural connection during that time. We may be really lonely for our families and extended families who we can't see. Um, particularly if we're birthing um, now over the holidays. Um, and, and, and so I think, you know, bringing in those recipes from your family, those things that you love to eat growing up, um, our traditional food ingredients, um, that can go a long way. Um, and then just, uh, you know, on the subject of isolation, I, I really recommend that new parents try to find um, other new parents to have in their circle is people that they can text and call and reach out to in that early time. I know for myself, um, just especially with breastfeeding, I think it was my friends who, who were also moms who really kept me um, supported and are the reason why I was able to successfully breastfeed because it was really hard at the beginning. Um, and, and that kind of care can be through FaceTime as well. So there's ways to get creative around that. Um, and then I did also just want to make the point that if it's available and appropriate for your care, that considering um, midwifery care um, can be a great uh, support, one, as we've already talked about for, for pregnancy and um, birth, um, that, that midwives can offer home birth. And of course, there's so many benefits of midwifery care. But um, one of the hugest benefits in my mind is that uh, midwives do in in-home um, postpartum visits. And this is um, a total game changer for families to not have to leave in that early postpartum, you know, to, to not have to go to a, a doctor's appointment and um, get out of your house on day five or seven. Um, that can be really anxiety inducing. And so um, considering midwifery care if possible. Um, and then last, I just wanna say that given all of the things that I just mentioned, I think that, um, and that have been mentioned so far, I think that as, um, as community organizations um, and uh, you know, people in like allied and indigenous health service organizations that we, um, this time is calling on us to get really creative and innovative um, to uh, support our, our parents and our families right now who are doing that work of um, birthing and raising up the next generation. Um, which is such sacred work. And I think that um, it, it's really calling on us to find ways to collaborate with each other as organizations and share resources and find resources for families. Um, even just with simple things like supplies, I think, I, you know, I would love to see there, there be, um, you know, just supplies made available to families, all of the things that I mentioned taken care of by community organizations so that doesn't have to fall on, on families because it can also be a financial burden as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, as a collective, we've worked really hard to build local partnerships with organizations. Um, and, um, and I think the more that we can do that, the better, especially um, when folks do have to leave community uh, for birth through the evacuation policy. Um, it's great for us, for example, when we have families come down from Bella Bella to have um, the relationships established with um, community health workers in Bella Bella so we can try to help um, you know, resource our families and make those transitions a little bit smoother. Um, so next slide. So I'm honored um, to close our presentation um, with, uh, by sharing my little sister's uh, story of pregnancy, birth and postpartum during the pandemic. Uh, so uh, my sister, 
Uh, her name is Alana Jubinville. She shares the same ancestry as me. So she is Cree, Soto, and mixed European. She's a small business owner and a mother of two. Her son is nine and her uh, baby daughter, Ivy, is six weeks old. Um, she is a small business owner and she lives in Okanagan territory in a Soyuz. Um, so I was uh, able to support her as uh, her doula for this birth, which was a really um, beautiful healing experience for us as sisters. And, um, and she um, had, had took some time to do some reflections on her experience. And um, I was able to support her uh, virtually and um, and then I, I wasn't present at the birth um, because there was just no way I was going to make it from Vancouver to um, to Penticton in time um, and so I did uh, I, I did offer in person postpartum care for my sister so um, so she wrote a letter and I'm just going to uh, read it out loud um, it's going to take about maybe uh, eight to ten minutes so just feel free to sit back relax. So I found out I was pregnant on March 1st, 2020 in the very beginning stages of COVID. Starting out my pregnancy during those very first days was a pretty scary time. It was hard to know how my prenatal appointments would go or how my plan of having a hospital birth would go. Now that I have lived through it, I'm able to share my experience and how it affected me. My prenatal visits went forward without too much changes in comparison to what I when I had my son besides having to show up wearing a mask and be exactly on time, not early, to avoid having a crowded waiting room. I was able to get all of the tests that determine mine and baby's health, both at the hospital and at the local health center. Nothing was canceled or not offered anymore when it came to our health. A few things that I was not able to do was have any classes that would have prepared me for birthing, breastfeeding, or becoming a new mom. I remember taking a few classes when I was pregnant with my son and they were all very helpful. Nothing like that was available this time around. The one thing that ended up affecting me the most that wasn't available was the hospital tour that they normally offer to pregnant moms. When I was ready to give birth, we parked in the wrong place, went in the wrong door and ended up walking very far to get to the maternity ward, all while in labor. These things would have been avoided had we gotten that hospital tour. If you get a chance to go to the hospital before the birth for any appointments, take in where you might park, walk and go when the time comes. We couldn't have any sort of celebration or baby shower and that was a missed event for us as it would have been nice to have some gifts and see family. Because my children have a nine year age difference, I had essentially nothing. I could have had some sort of Zoom meeting party but I'm still holding out hope that we can celebrate her in person, maybe for her first birthday. The other thing that affected me was all the actual wearing of masks. My pregnancy had me hot and dizzy feeling and the mask sometimes exasperated that feeling. It was especially hard to wear at work for long periods. I had to take more water breaks and was glad I had to go to the bathroom so much to be able to sit and take off my mask for a moment and take a few long breaths. During the majority of my, of my pregnancy, mask wearing was new and it wasn't required. It, it has changed now. I always wore my mask because that was important to me, but it wasn't always easy with the pregnancy symptoms. During my hospital birth, my partner and I were not expected to wear a mask during the birth or postpartum. It was offered to us to only stay 12 hours after giving birth in case we were worried about COVID or we could stay the usual two nights. We chose to stay the two nights as some tests they do at the hospital required the baby to be at least 24 hours old and we didn't wanna travel back to the hospital to get those tests. One thing that irked me during our hospital stay was that all of the people who entered our room, nurses, doctors, kitchen staff, and janitors, were all wearing different amounts or different kinds of PPE. Some wore masks, gloves, and face shields, while others wore only masks, and one nurse who came to do a heart test was wearing no gloves while touching my baby and was wearing a mask, but it was only covering her chin. I was too zonked to think about what was happening until after she left the room. If having everyone who enters your room suited up properly is important to you, make your position known. You can ask to see a nurse who wears proper PPE. During postpartum, COVID has affected who has been able to come and meet baby, but I think you will find most people understand. Don't underestimate how much your family and friends are willing to help. Ask them to go to the grocery store for you or deliver a home-cooked meal. I had a lot of help that way and was super grateful for it. 
Learning breastfeeding again was affected by COVID as well. I felt pressure to exclusively breastfeed after hearing that formula was selling out everywhere during the shopping madness earlier this year. It was scary to think that I wouldn't be able to feed my baby if I chose formula feeding. Also, the in-person breastfeeding support was affected as well. I was able to see a lactation consultant in the hospital, but the public health nurse that usually comes over to your house a few days after being home was just a phone call. I was having the most difficulty breastfeeding during that time and having an in-person meeting would have been beneficial. Luckily, I had other support outlets with my sister and was able to figure it out. Make sure you have a support system in place. My baby is now six weeks old and I'm ready to start venturing out into the world. Problem is the world isn't ready to be ventured out into. Make sure you keep your mental health in check. Having a baby can make you feel trapped and homebound. COVID also has that effect. So the two things together can be really hard to figure out. The pandemic has a way of making you feel very cut off from the normal supports, but having a doula made going through this experience during a pandemic a lot more comfortable. Danette prepared me for the birth and aftercare in ways I never could have thought of. She was there for me to answer any questions and give support at any time. She arranged with another one of my family members to ensure that they were able to bring me traditional medicines and meals to help my body and promote my milk supply. My partner is a first time dad and he benefited tremendously from Danette's advice and teachings. Despite the pandemic, I felt supported, prepared and cared for. And that's the end. Well, thank you so much, Elena. If you're on the call, I'm, I'm not sure if she is. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for um, for being able to share that story. Uh, I saw, I actually did the search and I saw that Alana was on earlier. I don't know if she's still on, um, but uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for, for sharing that story. It's it's invaluable. Um, so um, I think at this, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna um, say that the, the photos of our Alana in the, in the hospital in Penticton um, where, so they had to travel a little bit from a Soyuz and um, that's her partner, Kevin, there. Awesome. Um, and Elena, if you're still in, congratulations on uh, on having a newborn <laughs> join the world. It's so exciting. Um, all very happy for you. So I think at this point, uh, we're going to pivot and start answering some questions. We've kept a log of some of the questions that have been asked during the session um, so that we could kind of uh, so that we could chat them through now. Um, and while I'm doing this, if anything pops up for you in the chat box, please be sure to um, to, to throw it in there and, and we'll be happy to, to get to it. Uh, so one of the first questions- we... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, we do have one more slide um, oh, just okay. to, to sort of um, provoke some some conversation if, if you need a prompt. <laughs> there we go, awesome. So we got our prompt up. Um, I'm going to circle back to a question that was asked much earlier. Uh, Miranda or, or Danette, um, feel free to jump in here. But um, question from Linda asks, have you found that you have come across a high number of people that have not been able to access virtual care uh, in the pandemic due to a lack of technology? And if so, how have you addressed this situation? Um, for myself, um, no, I don't think that's been much an, of an issue for the clients that I've been working with. Um, I think in part because we are privileged living in a large urban center, um, Vancouver, and, and having um, generally, you know, pretty good like high speed internet available. Um, and I think for the most part, my clients um, haven't had those struggles. Um, but I do think about um, you know, re remote and rural communities, what the access may look like there. And especially now as we're heading into the winter season, it gets snowy, it, get, it gets icy, people get power outages. Even in my home community of Sawali, which does have high speed internet, the power goes out every year. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are barriers there for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um... I think another important piece here, only speaking from from my own kind of personal experience here, I know that um, there have been some nations and there have been some initiatives within my home community to make sure that uh, families have the supports that they need. Um, and potentially this could be uh, a, something that you look towards your your community to, to ask for. If you don't have access to that technology, 
Um, I know a few individuals who have, for example, small children that need to have the technology so that they can attend online classes. Perhaps it could be the same. Uh, I would say just opening up a communication channel if that's you um, and you're watching this um, to see what can be done Brandon, for the supports that exist. Yeah, for sure. Miranda and I were also just talking about last night how um, breastfeeding support from a helper perspective is quite doable uh, virtually particularly over FaceTime, um, but even over, over text or phone. Um, and, but I do think that if, if you are going to rely quite a bit on FaceTime, um, you do sort of need somebody else to hold the phone <laughs> or find a way to have the phone propped up. Um, so a stand or a pop socket or something, just little things like that can really help um, to get the care you need. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point too. Thanks to that. And I will add that um, I've seen, you know, within our community of birth workers, um, midwives and doulas sharing, uh, like posting online saying, I have a family I'm working with who is in need of certain specific items like a new phone or something like that. Um, and and so I think that community care is happening to, in a very like informal way to try to make sure that families who don't have access to what they need during this time are, being connected with people who can make a donation or help with fundraising. Um, but I think it's really unfortunate that there isn't more formalized long-term funding within the healthcare system to help these families, like that it ends up being done at this community grassroots level and on a donation basis. I would really like to see us as birth workers have more access to funding to help us provide this kind of support to our community. Um, and, you know, for ourselves as the Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective, we're not set up to apply for grants and administer grants ourselves. We are a, a simple collective. We're not a charity organization. We're not a nonprofit organization. We're not incorporated. Um, so for us, it requires finding partners within the healthcare system, partner organizations that we can work with, who we can uh, um, write grant applications together as co-applicants and then they can administer the funds for us. But even then we're talking about um, small amounts of money for a few thousand dollars here or there. Um, it's based on grants. It's not long-term sustainable funding um, that you know goes straight directly into programs that are serving families. So I think it's really community dependent what's working right now and how those families are getting the care that they need. You know, for some for some um, communities, it might be like through their band, they might be able to access some some um, resources that way. Or here in the urban setting, it's been very much like this grassroots community um, helping one another. But I would really like to see the healthcare system take more ownership of that and be investing more long term sustainable funding into this kind of work. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I've seen, or sorry, I've seen evidence of this happening, like, you know, across the board, especially during this pandemic, I've seen a lot of instances of communities helping communities and, and members helping members, you know, um, support between nations. And I think that's beautiful. It's a, it's a sign of our resiliency and our strength as Indigenous people. But I agree, absolutely, there should, there has to be systemic supports put in place. Um, okay, so we have, um, there was also a, a a uh, resource shared. Um, tell us as a program for low income families to help with access. I think it's called internet for good. So we'll take a look at that. And just to quickly clarify for everybody, any resources that we chat about today or that are mentioned, we'll do our best to kind of um, pull them all together and make sure that they get sent out to you uh, via email once the, the session is ready to go. So no need to be jotting down anything frantically from your notepad. We'll make sure that you get everything that you need from the session. Um, so uh, another question we had, um, so one question from Marcy chat, um, kind of coming back to something we were chatting about earlier and in, in the ways in which um, midwives or and or doulas, so I guess, you know, the birthing birth support um, team there, how are they not being supported by the government in the pandemic? I think it was a question um, we were chatting through a little bit about these systemic supports that exist and Marcy just had a question as to how they're not being supported or alternatively, what sort of supports would you like to see put in place? 
Mm -hmm. um, well, for myself, um, I, I've noticed that midwives, the Midwifery Association of BC, they've been um, posting um, throughout the pandemic about some of the struggles that midwives have been having. So I can't speak fully to capture that, but I, I do think, you know, midwives themselves are often, um, you know, struggling to sustain themselves in this work with having enough benefits. And, and I mentioned earlier, you know, even access to PPE and having to pay out of pocket for um, their own PPE, struggling to get even like the basic <laughs> support to stay safe themselves during um, this pandemic and, and being recognized that they are frontline healthcare workers and that they are being impacted by the pandemic. Um, and I think also just, again, kind of investing more in midwifery in general, um, that you know we need more midwives. We need more com more communities that have access to midwives, and midwives need backups, so they can't be the only midwife in their community. It's just not sustainable for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Danette, did you have anything to add, or um, I would just add that um, it wasn't always this way, but in these times, I think a lot of birth workers are are people who are also of reproductive age and have young families. And so I'm um, just thinking about all the midwives and and also healthcare workers and birth workers who whose work, um, who, they, they take risks when it comes to their own families and their ability to be at home with their families to, to do their job for other families. Um, and, and I think that there's not enough support um, to do that and, um, and that there should be um, more wherever possible, investing in childcare options so people can do this really um, essential work. Um, but also, I, I think somebody wrote in the comments too about how midwives, um, I think they, they don't get pensions, they don't qualify for maternity leave. So there's some really um, basic inequities. Mid student midwives also don't get paid um, to do their practicum, even though um, other professions like medical students and, and lawyers do. Um, so there's definitely some things I think that can be improved from a policy perspective to help midwives to to grow and sustain their work. Um, uh -huh. And there's some big gaps there for sure. Yeah, to incentivize it um, a little bit more, I think, to support birthing better in communities, right? Yeah, for sure. For and just like to... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, just to add to the point to Miranda saying how how because those supports don't exist a lot of this has fallen onto birth workers themselves um, to fill gaps for families and um, just you know from a doula's perspective I would add you know that piece around essential supplies that I was speaking to before um, you know I'm, I'm able to access the doulas for Aboriginal families grant program which pays up to a thousand dollars for Indigenous families to get doula care um, and all, all of our clients that have come through our collective um, have not been able to afford for private health care and have had to access the grant. And when I, um, when I get supplies for, for families, um, I pay that out of my own pocket and it, it comes, you know, that, that's less money that I, um, I end up getting from the grant program because I use some of it towards that. And the grant program of $1,000 is already 50% um, less than what non-Indigenous doulas um, receive like get paid from non-indigenous families um, generally in the Vancouver area at least so um, it, it's it's already there's that underfunding there for our families which I think we see always um, and then just because we are working for our families and our communities and we care so much um, you know we do things like uh, pay out of pocket for supplies and that's just something that we want to do and want to continue doing um, but but I don't think that that's um, that's fair. I think the health system could could do a lot more uh, to support our work that way. Yeah, I would just add to that, you know, like, as she's saying, a lot of our work is really essentially self funded. Um, and then it, you know, it, it is hard for us when we are, um, we are also, you know, like frontline healthcare providers in the sense that we are there alongside someone who's laboring and 
breathing heavily and we're in very intimate close contact with them and we are at higher risk of you know um, exposure when we're in that kind of environment as well but as self employed doulas we're not receiving pandemic pay and um, you know we have to arrange for backups for ourselves in case we have an exposure and have to quarantine and when schools and daycares were closed like I was on call without child care and it was extremely stressful and it does also lead to burnout and um, to really questioning like is it even sustainable for me to stay in this work and it's hard when so many of us are drawn to this work because it's a calling, it's a spiritual calling. Um, our ancestors have called us here to do this work. It is sacred work and we want to keep doing it, but the reality is that there aren't enough structures within the system in place to really, to support us in a good way. The grant program only goes so far. Um, and while they are making efforts to improve it, it, it isn't enough. Um, we really need to get beyond you know, grant funding um, for this kind of work. We need to get to a place where this is just long-term long sustainable program funding. Um, and that, you know, we are recognized as a critical member of the team um, for maternity care. And I think, unfortunately, like doulas, we're often in a position of, um, you know, um, as, as a role that can start like filling some of these gaps, but we are not, we, we cannot fill all the gaps in a, in a well known racist <laughs> healthcare system. Um, it can't be us alone doing it often self funded um, to fill all of these gaps. Like there needs to be more ownership on, on the part of the system um, to start filling those gaps and to help hold us up and uh, uplift us as birth workers to make this work sustainable. Um, I really do see uh, birth workers like midwives and doulas um, and other community care workers as being that interface between the healthcare system and community care. And I think we, it's really important that our voices be heard. Um, I think, you know, we can really translate to the health system about what community care actually looks like and what the gaps are and where we need to be investing more funding. Um, so I do think we need to have more of a voice within the healthcare system as well, um, and a chance and an opportunity to influence health policy. I think we need a be better health system pol policy infrastructure to help support us. When I go back to like that circle diagram I had of Indigenous people and birth and land all being connected, right now our healthcare system doesn't have the policies and infrastructure and funding in place to support that circle to get stronger and that's what we're trying to do but it's like we're doing it without any funding <laughs> so we need the system to set up policy policy infrastructure and funding to support us to lead that work yes here, yeah you're here thank you <laughs> that was really really well said Miranda and uh, I feel as I always do during our chats but I, I feel very humbled by the knowledge and the experience that you bring that you both bring and um Underlying all of that is the passion that you bring to, to supporting communities and good supporting birth in a good way. Uh, it's beautiful to see. So thank you both very much. Um, so I know I, I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I know that we're running out of it. Um, uh, so we're going to go through a couple questions as quickly as we can here. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, have you found that clients who don't have hospital birth births, sorry, have had challenging, have had challenges accessing LCs. I know I was uh, birthing seven years ago that it was a challenge and that wasn't during a pandemic. Forgive me, I don't know what an LC is. Lactation consultant. Sorry, was the question for in hospital birth or out of hospital birth? Uh, it was for in hospital birth. Or sorry, no, have you found that clients who don't have hospital births have oh. had challenge accessing LCs? Um, I think there has been some challenge in accessing in-person care. Um, there have been kind of like, as the pandemic has gone on, there's been periods where lactation consultants have been limited to virtual support. I think some lactation consultants, at least locally, have maybe been also doing some in-person um, care at various points throughout the pandemic. It's possible, but I think often it's it can be a barrier because um, lactation consultants, it, it would be considered private health care and therefore you'd have to pay out of pocket. Right. Okay. 
And in terms of in hospital, one of even then sometimes it can be um, a challenge if say there's not a lactation consultant on staff during the weekends. Um, and then, you know, someone bursts on, on Friday night and then they're discharged Sunday um, and they, they never got the chance to see one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did that, did you have something to add? Oh, I was just gonna add that, um, that it, it's never ideal to, to try to find that kind of support too in the postpartum. So um, just because it feels like a scramble and, and you have to you know, also deal with people's availability and things like that. So I would just, again, suggest um, trying to identify, if you think you might want those people, um, trying to identify them in the prenatal period, reaching out to organ organizations like La Leche League, finding out what services they're offering in your community and during the pandemic. Um, just like having, making that those, those supports familiar during the prenatal period will make it so much easier to access them in the postpartum. Awesome. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question. Is there anything we can do to bring SOGC on board? I feel that it is such a disconnect between OBs and nurses and doulas and midwives, um, but that whole, that, that spectrum of support is, is needed. So um, yeah, the question is how can they bring SOGCs on board? for birthing. I mean, I know that SOGC has released some really um, helpful policy statements in collaboration with Indigenous people over the years around um, to access to care uh, for sexual and reproductive health for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities, um, and things like that. And I, I think for sure there's space for that work to grow. And, and, and also just like when it comes to collaboration and, and um, integration between midwives and doulas and doctors and OBs. I think that's so important. And uh, for our collective, we've worked really hard to try to build relationships, um, at, at least with the indigenous midwives and doctors in our local area. Um, and, and we really feel like our work would be enhanced um, by being able to work more, more closely, especially with midwives um, and vice versa, I think. Um, and yeah, that, that, those models don't necessarily exist. So I think, I, I think there's a lot of space there to do some work. Uh -huh. Miranda, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I just, I saw one of the comments that said it's a long road ahead and I just really have to agree. I think so much of this work is about building relationships and that really does take time, um, for us, um, you know, being able to connect with other Indigenous healthcare providers and have like a group working together where we have that interdisciplinary approach. Like we have an indigenous OB and an indigenous um, family doc and indigenous midwife and indigenous doulas, like all of us being able to sit together. Um, a lot of power comes out of that. Um, and we are pursuing um, partnerships and research projects together with these um, interdisciplinary groups to try to move move forward with this kind of work and really think rethinking our service delivery models and trying to really get creative about new service delivery models that could best serve indigenous folks but as you say like it takes time i think there is a long road ahead i do think that you know um greater opportunities to start these conversations early on in training. So like in midwifery school, in medical school, those things can help just plant those seeds for those providers to start like to start thinking about this and how they integrate um, this kind of work into their practice. Um, so Danette and I are lucky to have opportunities to go speak to midwifery students, to speak to medical students. Um, I've participated in some training um, sessions with um, fourth year medical students. So I do think there is good work happening, but it's slow. And I do think we need to like pick up the momentum and keep it going. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to add really quickly to, um, in case there's anyone on the call from um, a, a university that um, houses medical uh, training programs, that I think that there's a lot that can be done to um, strengthen the resources available for Indigenous people to get into um, midwifery school and medical school and um, into all of those helping professions. I know there are affirmative action policies at most universities to allow, you know, so many spots for Indigenous students, but often I think that those number of spots almost works as a cap rather than, um, than a way of getting more people 
in. And I think you know that there's a lot of, of interest in those programs in our communities, especially um, do a lot of doulas go on to be student midwives. Um, the, out of the four of us who started the collective, three are now student midwives. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, from the First Nations Health Authority, from universities, from health systems, that there should be a lot more scholarships available um, for Indigenous students to access um, those programs and also um, get through those programs, which can be really like colonizing and, um, you know, just all of those power and privilege dynamics that we see everywhere exist in those programs too. Um, and, and it can be a barrier for Indigenous students to finish those programs. So I think that's something really important to look at as well. Some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Jessica, there are five Indigenous people in first year midwifery at UBC this year. That's a that's a fantastic achievement. We're very Yay. excited. Um, that's awesome. And, but I agree that work, work has to continue and the supports have to be put in place, not only into the programs to support the well-being of the Indigenous students who are in it, but also outside of it to make sure that it's it's a realistic and, and achievable goal for individuals to uh to to do that so uh it's 11 34 so uh i've really taken up all the time that i can today um i'm so sorry we didn't get to all the questions um perhaps it just means that there's there's demand to have danette and miranda come and join us again in the spring perhaps i'll, I'll ask nicely um so uh, at this point i just wanted to say again thank you so much miranda danette it's it's always a pleasure to have you join us um and i really i really appreciate the knowledge that you've shared today um, and to everybody else that's contributed to our chat box today, it was, it was overwhelmingly interactive and positive. Uh, I saw so much back and forth between individuals within the chat box. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everybody that participated there as well. Um, and before I sign off, uh, this, is a, this has been a, uh, a unique year for everybody. This is our last learning circle of 2020. Um, and uh, I thought a lot about what I wanted to say here and, and you know, good riddance to 2020 and hello to 2021 is, is certainly one of the sentiments, but I'd also want to highlight that this year has been difficult, but we've all come together in a really good way um, and, uh, and continue to, to, to work and to live in the best way that we can. So uh, before I sign off for the, for the winter, stay safe, Keep looking after yourselves, your families, your community members, and I look forward to seeing everybody again in the new year. Um, and hopefully seeing everybody soon um, in person. So um, yeah, with that, thanks everybody again and uh, have a good day. Take care. Thank you.